so uh, this chapter is going to be all about statistical modeling. Um, this is in contrast to the first chapter of this book that I covered a few months ago um, about probabilistic analysis. And so the big difference about what we're doing now as opposed to what we were doing earlier is that we are, um, we are starting with uh, a data set and we are working upwards to find a model with the parameters that would plausibly explain and generate the, the data set that we have at hand. Whereas before we had, we had um, a model with the parameters and uh, we could generate data at will. Um, so all the examples, um, uh, all the examples in this chapter are parametric. Uh, which means there are a small number of uh, unknown parameters. So um, a probabilistic analysis, I'm just gonna skip ahead, okay. Um, so I'm gonna start off by talking about the example that we covered uh, last, last um, our stats club the, for the first chapter, which was the epitope example. And so basically, this book introduced the concept of, um, or, or, or try to, try to uh, give an example of probabilistic analysis by um, giving an example of uh, an ELISA assay. So it's basically sequencing, like they, they basically sequenced n number, like 50 patients. Um, they sequenced a 100 position long um, protein and they conducted like this sample assay that would then demonstrate if um, that would that would come back with like a one if there was an epitope found at that position of a protein and they kind of um, they summed all of these hits across 50 patients and so there what we were left with was a 100 position long protein sequence with the num with like the number of hits found across all 50 patients at each position for the ability of the of an antibody to bind to the protein. Um, so uh, this this chapter starts out by loading and emitting the outlier. There was one um, one position that had like seven hits. And so that was like a big focus of the previous chapter and like finding the odds of um, randomly under a null hypothesis, randomly getting, um, getting that like particular distribution of hits. Um, so we're gonna remove that to make this simpler. And so now you can see there are this many, you know, the majority of these um, positions have no hits for um, um, being an epitope. And then this number has one, this amount has two hits for being an epitope. And um, we want to find out what theoretical distribution fits the data best. So we kind of, we, we start off by doing a goodness of fit diagram known as the rudigram, where we kind of hang the bars from the theoretical distribution points and see how well they fit. And as you can, this, this image is a little bit better proportion. So you, you can kind of see it's like, it's not aligned exactly, but it is around the same. It is also not wildly. I mean, we are just doing a visual inspection. We're seeing that it's not like wildly off base. Um, and so now it's asking us to do the same thing, but with like a randomly generated Poisson distribution. And, um, you can see it's a little bit, it's, it's different. Like this is what I guess you would expect with a Poisson model, uh, with a Lambda of 0.05. Um, so it seems to fit the Poisson model reasonably well. Um, but this is 
pretty much because solely because we removed the outlier. Um, so this is now we're kind of transitioning into talking about the maximum likelihood. Is everyone following me so far? Am I, do I sound, it, I, am I going at a reasonable pace? Great, I'm getting thumbs up. <laughs> okay, so um, now we're gonna talk about the maximum likelihood estimator, which is a way of choosing, um, it's a way of estimating the uh, parameter uh, lambda for the um, Poisson model um, that can like somewhat, at least somewhat faithfully replicate um, the data we already have at hand. So just a reminder, this lambda in a Poisson model, this parameter is simply uh, the number of trials times, it's supposed to represent the number of trials times the probability of success for instances where the prob probability of success is sufficiently small and the number of trials is sufficiently large. It's a way to like generalize a uh, distribution. Um, so we're going into, we're going into talking about how to, um, again, like simulate uh, a distribution with a model and find out which model with the particular parameters would best faithfully replicate the data we already have at hand. And here it kind of, here it's talking about how, um, we removed the outlier, which was uh, seven hits for one position. And that is a way to like make our model, the model we're looking for more generalizable. Um, but uh, it's just making the point that if we kept the outlier in our data set um, and still were able to find a model that gave us like a sufficiently small P value, um, we would, we would be, we would find um, our analysis would be very conservative. Does that make sense? Like if we were able to find a model that generated our data faithfully enough such that the P value was small, given, even given the outlier, we would say we like, could, we made a very conservative analysis. Um, so, here we're just tallying the outcomes. Um, and you can see like we have 58 zeros, um, 34 positions where there's one epitope hit, seven, two, posi sorry, um, seven positions where there are two epitope hits and then zero positions where there is even one epitope hit between, sorry, zero positions where there are epitope hits between three and six and then one where there are where is, there is seven. Um, so uh, we're kind of just like here simulating again, um, or for the first time rather, the what the distribution would look like with a, under a Poisson model, um, one hundred positions long with a lambda of three. So like you can, as you can see, it's different every single time, um, but it does not resemble our. A lambda of three does not really resemble um, our distribution at all. Like the book says here, has way more twos and threes than we see in our data. So it's unlikely that lambda of three will have produced our data. Um, and so if you, we were to do this same thing with um, different values of, or just with trial order. Oh, I don't think I did that. Anyway, um, instead of using trial and error, we don't need to do trial and error. Um, we can use uh, maths. Hold on, I'm I'm looking at. Is this okay? This is it. So here, it um, calculates the probability of seeing the data if the value of the Poisson parameter is m. So now we're kind of like trying to find the probability of seeing this distribution by finding the product of the individual probabilities. Um, so I kind of, I kind of just took this piece of code here, but then I made it a little bit. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Uh, 
Okay, we're back to where we were. Um, yeah, so here I find the um, product, or I, I find the Poisson distribution of these counts and, um, or these numbers of um, epitopes found at these frequencies. Um, so this to the power of, I don't know. I, I, yeah, so I find a Poisson distribution first with a lambda of three, and then I raise it to the power of the frequencies at which they were found. And I kind of just, I found the product of all of those and it gave me this probability. Um, and so that's one way of going about it. Uh, and you can see that I kind of applied the same thing um, using different values for M, which is the, uh, which is Lambda and the Poisson distribution. Um, but there's an even easier way to do this. And that is finding the log likelihood. And so they wrote a script that kind of automates doing this. And um, here we find using this code. So we, we define a vector of lambdas, 100 elements long um, in 0 0.05 uh, increments. And we apply these lambdas to the log likelihood function that we just defined. And we plot it. And what this shows is that the, the lambda value that would give us, well, that would most faithfully reproduce our assay is 0 0.55 according to this plot, according to these calculations. So that's pretty cool, right? But guess what? There's an even easier way to do it. And it's just this function called good fit. Um, and if you extract this element from the good fit object, you'll just get, you'll just get the uh, ideal Lambda value. Is everyone following me so far? We're we doing good. All right, just checking in. <clears throat> so, um, skipping ahead, uh, here we are introduced to the concept of, um, or rather, our concept of the null mo mod the excuse me, the null model is edified, um, and so we're 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 saying that in the classical statistical testing framework. When we consider a single model that we call the null model for the data, um, we we kind of define the null model as the uninteresting baseline, like what you would expect if there was nothing in particular going on. And then we are looking for departures from that as evidence for something going on. They very broadly speaking, of course, you guys already know this. Um, so, okay, here it talks about linear models and um, regression. I'm going to skip ahead from that. Uh, now we're going to talk about binomial models and maximum likelihood. So, um, so we're going to start off with an example. Uh, let's say we take a sample of 120 males and test them for red, green, color blindness. Um, and we code the data as zero if the subject is not colorblind and one if he is. And so um, intuitively, you could say that the value of P being finding a male that is colorblind is about one in 12, since the sum of these two values is 120 and 10 out of 120 of these males are colorblind. And if that's what you thought, you would be correct. Um, but there's another way we can plot this um, and compute the likelihood for many possible P values. Um, and by P, I mean uh, probability. Um, so here we, uh, again, do something similar to what we just did, which is um, from zero to 0 0.3, uh, 
in increments of 0 0.005, um, we create a list, we create a vector of probabilities, and we find the log likelihood, um, the, the probability of success, not, not the log likelihood, but we find the probability of success. Um, and we see here that at around what at around oh yeah at around 0 0.05 is 0 0.085 that is that is the that is the p that most again most faithfully replicates our data and this here the book is making the point that okay 0 0.085 is not exactly 0 0.08333 infinitely repeating because that is what one divided by 12 is, but it's close enough. And the reason we didn't even get that is because um, it kind of skipped over that number given our increment. Um, uh, okay, what, what, did I, what did I say here? Um, the likelihood and the probability. So now it is distinguishing like likelihood and probability, which is something I did not, was not able to, I guess, fully comprehend, which is that the likelihood and the probability are the same mathematical function interpreted different ways. So in one case, it tells us how probable it is to see a particular set of values of the data given the parameters. In the other case, we consider the data as fixed and ask for the particular parameters particular parameter value that makes them more make, makes the data more likely. So I guess in the case of likelihood, um, or no, I guess in the case of like, so in the case in the case of probability, we are considering the data fixed and looking for the right. Um, we're, we're working, we're, we're working towards finding the right parameter for re faithfully replicating our data, um, give it the model and then for likelihood, um, we are merely, we are trying to see how likely it is to see a particular set of values of the data given the parameter. Does that make sense? Is that, is that, does that sound like I understand what I'm talking about? Okay, so um, here we define another, here we define the log likelihood function um, with these default values. Um, and in this case, we're supposing that n equals n equals 300 and we have 40 successes for the binomial distribution. Um, and here, once again, um, you can intuitively, you can intuitively feel that, um, okay, if we want to find the probability of success and we have 40 successes in 300 trials, you could simply do 40 divided by 300 and find the correct um, data value. And um, if that's what you thought, you'd be correct, which is consistent, it's consistent with intuition, this idea that you have. But um, you can also see that a wide variety of different data would also satisfy that intuitive um, that um, intuitive conclusion. Um, other values of theta are almost equally likely and the function is quite flat around the maximum. So uh, one piece of confusion I had was why, and I guess I, I figured this out by going into chapter one, but um, why theta, what theta specifically represents. And in this case, theta represents um, both not both n and y. It's kind of like lambda for the Poisson distribution, but this is a binomial distribution, so it's not going to have lambda. Um, theta is basically the same thing, I think. Not I me, mean, not really, but it's the parameter for the binomial distribution model. Um, okay, we're doing good so far. We're going to move on to multinomial data. Okay, so now we're going to load into our memory, uh, data from one strand of the, for the genes of staph, the staph bacteria. Um, so let's do that. I think it's gonna take a second. No, it's already loaded. All right. So we're gonna be working with this sequence, this nucleotide sequence that's about 1300 
positions long. Um, and we can see, we use the function letter frequency to see the frequency with which each nucleotide um, appears. Um, so I'm sure we, we all know that the nucleotides, because of their physical properties, um, not only across the whole genome, but also in segments of the genome occur at different rates. Um, and so you could roughly expect, you could definitely expect the um, A and T and G and C to occur at equal frequencies, but AT, the AT and GC may not. So um, that's the kind of analysis we're going to be doing right now for multinomial analysis. We're going to look to see if these four nucleotides occur at the rate that we would expect them to um, randomly if they were to appear completely randomly. So what we're going to start out by doing, what we're going to start out doing is um, we're taking this staff object and we're applying letter frequency to it using V apply. And um, we're basically only going to extract the first 10 genes from the first element of the staff object. And we're going to get the proportions. So here we have a table of the proportions of each nucleotide in each gene. And you can see already that like across individual genes, they're not, um, they're not totally. And in fact, what I said was earlier was wrong. Cause like they it says that the, the A's and the T's, the, the parts that match each other aren't exactly equal either. Um, so we're going to get the means of each row. And you can see this is the, this is the mean proportion across all 10 genes um, of the uh, nucleotide frequency. And we're going to assign this to this object, P0. So we are going to do uh, use a Monte Carlo simulation to test whether the departures between the observed letter frequencies and accept, expected values under the supposition is are within a plausible range. So what we're going to continue to do is we're going to use these proportions that we have derived from the first 10 genes to create like a thousand tables or something of these um, letter frequencies. And then we are going to see if the ones that we observed uh, we're going to see if the ones that we observed are significantly different from the ones that um, we randomly generated. So we start by getting the column sums, the sums of all of the nucleotides present in each gene of this staff object, um, the first element of the staff object. And we are going to take the outer product of um, the probability of the column sums. And so this is something I had to look up. I did not remember what an outer product is, but it's when um, you are multiplying two vectors, one of which is horizontal and the other one is vertically arranged to create a matrix. And so here we have like um, another table of the column sums multiplied by the probability of each nucleotide um, occurring for each gene. And we have this expected table. So this is like based on the probabilities that we derived from the all 10 genes. This is the accept, expected number of raw, um, like the absolute number of nucleotides we would expect from for each of the 10 genes. Uh, am I doing good so far? Is everyone following? Cool. Um, so now we are going to get into it. I guess here we demonstrate that if we were to use our multinome, the function our multinome to create like a multinomial distribution using this, using this um, um, anonymous function, using this table of probabilities and passing the column sums to the function. Um, the number, the column sums of the 
random table will equal the column sums from our observed um, set of nucleotides from the first element of the staff object that we loaded. Um, here we are using reusing this function that we defined in the previous chapter, stat, um, and it does uh, it computes the test statistic. So we do this for each table, um, and we replicate this. We do this simulation a thousand times, and then we we use this test statistic to see how much our table departed from um, we see how much we, we see how much our table departed from um, our simulation. So here we already have the histogram. Here you can see this red line representing the uh, test statistic for um, our observed data. You can see that across all 1000 simulations, our particular um, set of nucleotide frequencies uh, was not observed. In fact, there's not really anything near it. Um, and just to be sure, we can go in here and see that we tab 10. Tab 10 is our observed. These are our original 10 genes and expected tab 10. These are the ones that we generated um up here so by doing a test like this doing a simulation like this we can um we can reasonably conclude we can reasonably say that the 10 genes do not seem to come from the same multinomial model as the one we were able to produce uh, by deriving the probabilities of the nucleotide frequencies from that from our observed set um cool does anyone have any comments or questions so far how are we doing on time all right we're about 30 minutes in we're good um cool so now uh now we're entering the portion of the chapter where things start getting a little bit fuzzy for me i think i think i i have a few more of these like little sections but then once it starts talking about Markov chains, I kind of fell off, but we'll we'll make it there. Um, so the theor the theoretical distribution of the Simulstat statistic, the Simulstat the statistic being defined up here, the one thousand simulations of the um, nucleotides appearing in each of the ten genes. Um, is called the chi-squared distribution. And, you know, we all know about that, the chi-squared distribution. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's what that means. And um, here it's making the point that the granularity of the computation is going to always be the inverse of the number of um, simulation replications you did, number of simulations you did. You cannot estimate probabilities any smaller than that. Um, uh, so here we're kind of going into QQ plots. Um, I think like the first in this field, the first type of plot I ever worked with were QQ plots. The first type of plot I ever fully understood. Um, uh, but like, I, I, I think I talked to someone recently and I was like, yeah, like QQ plot and they didn't know what it meant. So th this is one instance where I feel like I know something. <laughs> That wasn't already that was already in the book. Um, so uh, basically, like it starts by defining what a quantile is, which is if you were to um, it, it's difficult. It's it's like if you were to break the data set or if you were to break your observations into um, a number of partitions that is equal to um, the number of observations. Um, that's a quantile. But then also, if you break it up to 100 partitions, which would be percentiles, that's also a type of quantile. So it's saying that if you were to look at values between, for example, the 22nd and the 23rd value, 
you'd be looking at the 0.22 quantile or the 22nd percentile. Um, then later we're gonna be talking about this, um, but we don't have to talk about that right now. Um, and so where's the QQ plot? Okay, this is a QQ plot. Um, so in this example, it's comparing the chi-square distribution. Uh, it's, it's comparing these points um, along the chi-square distribution and the simulstat value. I'm going to be honest, I don't completely understand what this plot is portraying, but I do understand the general concept of QQ plots, which is that if you see like a market uh, a market deviation from this diagonal yellow the diagonal red line which is supposed to um, represent the null distribution the um sorry the null model you are witnessing like some sort of of uh, they're witnessing something going on some sort of enrichment so uh the kind of plots i would work with were those which kind of um, we're measuring the p-value association of each SNP with uh, the uh, GWAS trait in question. And so if you were to see an enrichment of the SNPs in a particular trait, it would kind of curve off upward um, off the uh, null model line. And then conversely, if there was a negative association, it would curve away. So that's a QQ plot. Um, and uh, yeah, we just kind of simulate this, simulate this whole thing here with the um, R markdown file. Um, so with, uh, this is a very small p-value and therefore the null model, null hypothesis seems improbable. That means we cannot, reject the, um, that means we can reject the null model um, and accept the alternative or potentially embrace the alternative hypothesis. This computation did not require a thousand simulations and was much faster. So QQ plots are a way of testing whether or not your observed data fits the, um, null hypothesis. Okay, we're gonna talk about this guy now, char graph. Uh, this guy was able to like, uh, yeah, this guy was able to determine whether the nucleotides in a DNA molecule um, occurred at equal free frequencies just by weighing them out, which is pretty cool. Um, so you can see, and apparently in his um, original publications, uh, he only published the percentages of mass present in different organisms for each of the nucleotides, not the measurements themselves, which I don't know why you wouldn't do that. I don't know if this was like an oversight, like this was like a, you know, part of like the historical, maybe like historically science was not always quite as rigorous. Maybe there was like a less of a expectation of scientific rigor. I don't know. Or maybe there's something I don't know about what goes into weighing out molecules to find the um, nucleotides present, percentage of nucleotides present in the molecules. But either way, um, you see these are like charts of the different nucleotides present in each of the different organisms. Um, and so now we're going to talk about two categorical variables. Okay, this is or blindness and sex. Okay. Um, okay, contingency table, we can, this is a contingency table. You guys know about those, right? I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm vaguely aware of them. They're like tables that show the coincidence of two different traits or two different observations across all the samples, apparently. And so for the females in this data set, you can see this is the, this is the different rates of eye and hair color combinations. 
Um, and we're going to go on to color blindness now. We're going to see if the rate of color blindness is more or less or the same as what we would expect. So this is a function in R called the chi the chi square test. We all know about. I know about. The, I've heard chi square test before. Um, oh, the data set is not loaded. Let's go. All right. So we got a chi square test. The small p value tells us that we should expect to see such a table with only a very small probability under the null model, which means that this sort of thing, this is not random and there's something going on. Like it also, if you were to just look at it, you could definitely see that there are way more men than women who test positive for color blindness. Um, okay. This is, I think that this is gonna be the last section I talk about. Going ahead a little bit. Yeah, yeah, this is gonna be the last section I talk about. Um, definitely, okay. So I'm gonna talk about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which is, I think something I've learned about at some point, but I've since forgotten. Um, but the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is looking at um, two, alleles and also a third level created with a combination of these two alleles. And it's trying to see if the incidence of these allele combinations, um, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium says is, um, is when the incidence of these three allele combinations are completely random discovered to be completely random, there is an independence of the frequency of both alleles in the genotype, um, random mating a large population with equal distribution of the alleles across among sexes. Um, yeah, so I guess the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium kind of is like the null hypothesis of allele frequency in Popu or organi organisms and populations and, and, and across sexes. That's my interpretation of it anyway. Um, but we load this uh, library and we extract the, these like three rows, I guess these three populations, 240 and 216. And, um, excuse me. Tahiti data. Okay, so we're only going to work with the Tahiti, the 216th line. And um, I guess I, this is another thing I had a, this is something I had a problem with. I wasn't quite sure what is being done here. Like we are looking at the probability, the p value with which the probability that these P, oh, P stands for one of the alleles. P is like stands for, P stands for M. So this is saying like the M occurs at a point, almost 0. 0.6 frequency. And then, but then we can just skip all of this and do use the um, AF function, um, allele frequency function. And there we go p hat p hat squared and then we can get the um so this is mm p hat squared would be mm the other allele would be one minus p hat and then i guess both of the alleles would be one or two times p hat times q hat and um and then these are the expected frequencies, and we can see that the expected frequencies line up pretty well with the um, observed frequencies. Uh, okay. And then lastly, last thing I'm going to touch on is this ternary plot, this Hardy-Weinberg ternary plot, which um, kind of shows that if if your population does not fall in this, in the, I guess another word for it is the De Finetti plot. If your population does not fall along this band, this narrow band, 
of the plot, then they are not in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium for that position. So, um, yeah, I'm going to stop there. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Um, I may pick up the rest of the chapter in a. I, I should, honestly, I should pick up the rest of the chapter in a following our stats club presentation, maybe sooner rather than later. Um, but uh, this was a good, this was good. I, I feel very good. I felt, feel very good about this presentation. I felt very good about this presentation. Thank you guys for listening. And um, yeah, if you guys have questions or if you want to, any corrections or comments or anything like that, I'm, I'm all ears.